This episode of the Zulu Podcast is sponsored by Zulu Inc., a benefit corporation dedicated to the goal of universal access to toilets, hygiene, clean water, and sanitation through the power of social enterprise. Learn more at Zulu.com. Oh, that's just they grade got, they, A customer service. They've right got there. more. They've got more female toilets than male. <laughs> that toilets. over a thousand toilets. I still, but yeah. how, I can't even imagine how much. I know because you're take. like picturing like the vivid arena, right? Yeah. And you're like, okay, how many? There's toilets? like ten There's stalls in each like, one. Yeah, yeah. So I assume are these single stall, like, yeah, just one person Sing- in at a time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Still, so anyway, that's very uh, cost three billion dollars. Oh wow. my word! And. Um, Anyway, that was, uh, yeah, they asked him, what, what, do, what do you like so much about the stadium? He's like, toilets. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Welcome to the Zulu Podcast, where we talk all things poop, toilets, and sanitation. Through insightful news, impact stories, and quirky humor, we aim to discuss and highlight the critical role toilets play in whisking poop out of our lives. The impact toilets have, or lack thereof, in the health and wellness of humanity, and what Zulu is doing to help solve the current global sanitation crisis. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Zulu Podcast. We are ready for another awesome episode of the Zulu Podcast. We've got such a treat. We had Sarika on, who is the general manager of the World Toilet Organization. I swear, each week we just keep getting a superstar, like sanitation superstar, uh, to come and talk with us. So Darren and I last had the time, opportunity. Last time I saw her, I was wearing this shirt. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the World Toilet Summit. I was a little more sweaty than I am right now, but you know, <laughs> I did watch this. And this you met. I like that. Yeah, you met Sarika at the World Toilet Summit, yeah. uh-huh. and she just was the most popular gal there. Yeah, I'm she was sure. Great. She's mm-hmm. great. That's got to be a big event for her to manage. That'd be overwhelming. Yeah. Just the amount of work to just to organize that whole thing. Yeah. Like right now they're working on trying to do the next World Toilet Summit, either in Tokyo, could be in Indonesia. But just, you know, she's got to work with a lot of government agencies, a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of NGOs and just try to coordinate that whole thing. I mean, it's a big job. It's know, a big sure. job. So she's a superstar. We're excited for you to listen to our chat with her a little bit later on. Before we do that, I've got to read a fun fast fact from our special yeah. book. This is going to be around for the next couple episodes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, you're we'll plowing through, through the, the whole uh, we're, we're plowing through, you know. Learn a lot while you... Sit on the pot. It's like, a little, it's like a little jingle, you know. <laughs> okay, but just one today because we got to savor these. Okay. You know? Yeah. Who, 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 who wrote this book? Do we I, know? This is a good question. I don't know. Alex Smart. I bet oh. he's British because they said we instead of P. That's... That's true. Yeah. They did. You remembered that from, yeah. Yeah. The birds have the best words for all things bathroom related. Agreed. It's maybe that's why there's so much poo news that comes out of England. <laughs> I true. don't know. Yeah, it's true. Okay. But this is called extreme excrement. Hmm. So this is just a fun fact about our, you know, little eight-legged spider friends. It's that some spiders disguise themselves as bird excrement so that they don't get eaten. For example, the orb spider has a silver web and a silver body. So birds just think it's poop. That's what I would do. <laughs> I would tell you like, I'm poop. Don't eat me. And Don't sit me. in like the middle of a white splatter of yogurt and then you're golden. Yeah. It does make me nervous now thinking about whether something, I mean, hopefully I could tell them apart, but sometimes at a quick glance, you know, maybe I couldn't. Is that bird poop on my car? I mean, either way, spider? I'd hope you'd avoid it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm <laughs> not like I'm going around touching, but you know, I don't know. It's just a... I mean, we don't know clever. where these orb spiders live. Wouldn't it be great if like people poop was like white, like a different color? Or would we care? I think if brown it were, is not a very flattering color. But I think well, if it, it were white. It seems to be like less, um, I don't know. That might be harder to tell Wait. apart from snow. That's true. <laughs> I'm just saying. But we might feel the same way about white that we do about brown if our right. poop was white. And that yeah, would, it's all different colors, right? So. Yeah. 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 I shoot rainbow poop. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> you Speaking must use a squatty potty. <laughs> That's right. Speaking of colors, we've got uh, Who Gives a Crap latest edition of their uh, party edition. Cute. And, it is so uh, cute. Lots of fun, awesome. lots of color. Lots of there's, color. I think there's a rainbow in here, Jocelyn, for you somewhere. Yeah, that's that's. There the you one. go. There, there's your I love poop, it. Your poop colored rainbow right yep. there. So cute. Um, well, what's in the poo news, Darren? Uh, well, I was just going to say, we can, a lot of these a lot of these things we're talking about, like these, uh, who gives who gives a crap? Toilet uh-huh. paper. You can find it on our 
uh, new Zulu Marketplace. Oh, yeah. Which is uh, just launched. Uh, we have, we don't have a lot of products there, but it's slowly, we're, every week we're getting new and um, new products, new partners who are um, wanting to put their products up on the marketplace and It'd be such a fun place to shout for a bachelorette party. Oh or, my gosh, or a bachelor it, party. it would be a blast. <laughs> but yeah, we've got, uh, you know, toilet, toilet, obviously toilet paper, toilet related products, uh, feminine hygiene products, uh, pet products, different, well, lots of variety there, you know. And so uh, go check it out. Go check it out. It. Go shopping. Take yourself Do shopping. shopping. Treat and yourself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and a portion of every uh, every sale goes toward uh, Zulu Humanitarian's uh, toilet building. So Right you know. on. Couldn't get any better than that. Anyway, so anyway, so um, yeah, as far as the poo news, because I know that's why people tune in. They don't, <laughs> they don't uh, tune in for commercials or things like that. Um, this is a... Um, well, actually, this is a little bit of sad news. Um, oh, no, wait. This is not the sad news. This Good. is... I don't really uh, want to hear yeah. any sad news. I'm not in the mood for sad news. Yeah, this is a... Oh, they, well, yeah, this is kind of a cool news. They, they've they discovered... Um, they think they think this is the world's oldest flushable toilet. Hmm. I think... Did you send me this article? It sounds familiar. The, the, in, in China, uh, this 2,400-year-old toilet was discovered in the in the remains of a palace and it is totally it's got i mean it looks kind of old i don't know if you can see that but it's got a, like a pipe oh, coming wow. out yeah. you know, the bottom of it it's like a box right and it's yeah, on an incline in so it looks like stuff would yeah oh. and it's at an incline Fall, where you know down. you poop in the box but then you know it kind of slide toward the back of the box and down the pipe thanks gravity and using <laughs> water and it was a flushable Flushable system. Wow. Um, it was in use between uh, 221 BC and uh, 206 wow. BC in China's Sha Zai province, and um, and they would use they would water and flush it away. So that looks more effective than some toilets I've used yeah. in my lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. Yeah. So uh, anyway, they're um, you know toilets been around for a while. That's awesome. Yeah, because yeah, I remember the first, uh, no, it was a different article that I'd sent to you. I think about the first like automatic flushing, not automatic, um, just flush toilet with like a whole mechanized system was in London mm -hmm. uh, and it was King somebody's toilet, but it had like a lever that you'd pull and it would do that. It wasn't it wasn't this, and it certainly wasn't that old. So this is like making all my archaeology mm -hmm. lever cells just so happy. Yeah, yeah. They say they were they weren't very common. This is used by a by a basically a royal right uh, one of the emperors in their in their household. But uh, anyway, but very very sophisticated kind of a luxury item, kind of like a kind of like a fancy bidet, kind of like your you know your uh, Kohler. Seven thousand dollar toilet yeah. nowadays, right? Do you think any of the any of the servants ever went home and just was like, "I got to recreate this for myself." I'm going to build my own. I'm going to build my own. I would. I'd like try to piece together some right plywood. And they had make royal one. toilet envy, especially if you're the one scrubbing oh. that thing, you know, or or I don't know what your duties are, but yeah, it can make your life easier. I just. Absolutely. You know, that's going to throw any archaeologist for a, a loop, any historian, if that yeah, ever 10, is discovered. Yeah, 10,000 years from now, they're like, what? You 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 pooped in these porta potty plastic boxes? <laughs> and how archaic, uh, right? Right. Yeah, it's true. You didn't use laser beams to zap it away. <laughs> um, well, I guess somebody else that's excited about toilets is um, ex-Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer, who is uh, the owner of the of the uh, Clippers in Seattle and uh, they, they're they building a new arena there. And as beautiful as the arena is, he was most excited about toilets. Um, 1,000, 1,160 toilets in the facility. Wow. Which is three times the number of toilets that are in any other stadium or sports venue. Three times. That is and, impressive. And That's, they had to spend a lot of money to do it. And they, said, and they asked, well, why, why did you spend so much money? And he was like, we want the fans that come to our stadium 
not to be standing in line at a toilet. They yeah. want him back in the seats at the game. This yeah. man understands. And so they basically yeah, they they was consciously put in that many more toilets. So, you know, if you go there, you're not going to be standing in line. Yeah. You know. Oh, that's just they've grade got, they, A customer service. They've right got there. more. They've got more female toilets than male. I, that toilets. over a thousand toilets. I still, but yeah. how, I can't even imagine how much. Room I know because you're take. like picturing like the Vivint Arena, right? Yeah. And you're like, okay, how many? There's toilets? like ten stalls There's probably in each like, one. Yeah, yeah. So I assume are these single stall, like, yeah, just one just person single. in at a time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Still, so that's anyway, very uh, cost three billion dollars. Oh my word! And. Um, Anyway, that was, uh, yeah, they asked him, what, what, do, what do you like so much about the stadium? He's like, the toilets. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Anyway, so. Uh, and it keeps the, keeps the janitorial staff. Yeah. Very busy and highly employed. Yes. That's well, awesome. Maybe, maybe less so because, you know, I think about it, you know, o- toilet overuse, like one toilet being used by uh, lots of people. Right. You know, probably a little, little messier than. Yeah, I think I just mean like you know. general, like. But yeah, clean. Probably, you got more to clean. Yeah, more to clean. Right, but obviously. maybe not as intense of a cleaning. True. Which is so if you're if you're going to the game better. up in Seattle, like I don't know when this is. I don't think it's open yet. Maybe it's. Uh, I think it's open. Maybe it's open now. When did the Clippers move to Seattle? Mm. Was that a recent thing? Oh, okay. So oh, I'm sorry. Did I say Seattle? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> It shows my level of sports knowledge. <laughs> it could have fooled me. I you know, know I, even I thought, less. You know what I thought? I thought, oh, it's, you know, he's former Microsoft. I thought, oh, uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's Seattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's sense. Los Angeles. So next time you're in Los Angeles, go to the Clippers game. Just, you yeah. know. Enjoy one of the toilets. Enjoy the toilets. Let us open. know. Let us know how Let it goes. Let us know which number you, you know. used. Was it fourth? <laughs> 447 <laughs> was it number 622 they number all the stalls that'd yeah. be awesome yeah which one is the most is the most try them all one? and let us know it'd be an efficient way to say this you know clean up and stall 612 yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever anyway i think on that high note we should just jump right into our chat with sarika and yeah see what she has to say let's do it yeah well, Sarika, welcome to the Zulu Podcast. We are so delighted to have you on. Delighted to meet you. I know Darren's reconnecting. So welcome. Excited to have you here. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, be with all of you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, well, I would love it if you could tell our listeners, our audience, who you are, your the general manager of the World Toilet Organization, which is amazing. But tell us, like, how did you get connected with WTO? That just seems like a really big role to have in an amazing organization. And I'm curious, curious about that. Uh, So let's start with uh, uh, where I am from, and then I can take you to how I connected with WTO. My name is Sarita. I'm the general manager for World Target over eight years. And uh, I have my background in development. I work with uh, organizations like American India Foundation and Ministry of Rural Development in PAS. Uh, I come from a small city called Saharanpur. It is in northern part of uh, India. And uh, you might be aware of cities like Dehradun and Haridwar, which are famous for yoga, meditation, retreats and Kumbh Mela as well. So Saharanpur is uh, just 80 kilometers away from Haridwar. And uh, how I connected with uh, uh, Jack or WTO is, uh, uh, there's a story behind it. I was volunteering for an organization called AVPN. There I heard Jack speak for an event. And I was very impressed uh, when he was talking about his work. And then I met a couple of my colleagues there, interacted with them. And uh, that's how my journey started uh, with WTO. I connected with them. I liked the organization. They were looking for a person with a background in who has worked in India and uh, have worked with the government governments in India. So. Our background mashed. That's how we started working together. That's so incredible. And incredible that your paths would cross even countries away. Um, was nonprofit humanitarian work 
especially sanitation related, something that was always in your mind? Or is this like a new, new thing for you as it is for most of us, I think, in the world of sanitation? Uh, sanitation was never on top of my agenda ever in my life. I wanted to work for livelihoods and I worked uh, quite a long time. I spent almost 10 years working in the livelihood sector, helping people uh, find jobs, work with social enterprises, create uh, small businesses. Or, In fact, while I was working with American India Foundation, I was quite uh, instrumental in creating skill development program for unemployed youth. So we were giving trainings to them so that they can be employed in upcoming sectors at the entry level jobs. And at that time we were working in five states and uh, I have played a very instrumental role in structuring the whole program, which helped in scaling the program to 28 states in India. So sanitation was never on my radar. Uh, it, it just so happened that after birth of my son uh, uh, in 2013, uh, I started looking into sanitation as a problem because when my son was born, he he was born in Singapore. And after his birth, I took him to India and he severely got infected with uh, diarrhea and I, he was hospitalized. When he was hospitalized, then I saw there were so many kids suffering the same problem. And when you ask doctor or nurses, they had no clue. They said, oh, it's a common problem, but they never realized that it is linked to poor sanitation and hygiene. And that's how my interest grew over the period in uh, when I traveled to other countries, I realized the magnitude of the problem is very big. There are uh, 800 kids every day dying just because of the diarrheal diseases. And as for WHO, this is uh, the seventh biggest killer in the world. And uh, you must be surprised to know that this is preventable. Uh, we just need to pay attention to proper sanitation and hygiene, which is crucial to eradicate this disease uh, from the world map. Wow. So did, was your was your son okay? Did he recover? Yes, he recovered, uh, but uh, he had to go through this problem a couple of times. And you might be surprised that he had gone through all the penetratory vaccination. And when you go to India and you talk to doctors that... Uh, he got two dosages of rotavirus. Even then, he is getting diarrhea. So the doctor used to say, oh, rotavirus is for Singapore. It will not work in uh, countries like India. And to my surprise, my, uh, I was questioning even the doctors and myself. We don't need rotavirus in Singapore because it's a clean city. We need rotavirus in India because people are getting infected. Kids are getting infected with the diarrheal diseases. So this is good for... Uh, such diseases and if it is not effective why we need it so then uh, you keep thinking uh, over this problem again and again and then you try to find out what are the reasons and then your search for the reasons take you to different uh, lanes and then you realize oh it is because the kids are drinking contaminated water and many a times families are not even aware of that all the toilet waste is contaminating the water resources uh, because the untreated waste is dumped into the water bodies and that's how the virus is contaminating the drinking water and then people are getting infected and it's 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 there's a whole ecosystem which gets affected so it's it's a learning and a, a learning uh, in itself so you said 800, 800 children a day uh, is yes. a pretty big number. Yes. Um, what, what did the what did the doctors say was a solution, or were they just sort of, you know, throw uh, up their hands and say, "Well, that's how, that's how it is," or what were they suggesting as solutions for it? Uh, 
the the solution they don't have a fixed solution for it in fact it's an opportunity for them to make money it's it's a, it's a truth though it doesn't sound good but uh, uh, solution somewhere lies in understanding the root cause of the problem and uh, uh, doctors especially in india and many developing countries they know very well that solution doesn't lies in their hands they can only cure the prob- uh, cause, uh, cause uh, in the affected children but they cannot eradicate the problem because solution lies somewhere else either it is with the government or with the, the uh, with the organizations like wto who can voice uh, lend a voice to this cause and create an awareness at every level so that different stakeholders are coming together and working to create a change which we are doing through our world toilet summit creating awareness and bringing the stakeholders on a common platform to bring change in sanitation sector yeah so you mentioned meeting uh jack uh, jack sim uh, mr toilet um i guess he was, he's been called mr toilet for a long time uh when you first met him or you heard the presentation did you immediately think oh this is something i want to get involved with or uh how did that happen uh when i met jack i was in awe uh, with his presentation style the way he was communicating and connecting with the audience that was amazing and uh, at that time i had not thought of that i would be working for david it so happened i heard him there at the event then i saw uh, there was a, a vacancy in his organization i applied for it and, and i got through and then i i feel i was lucky enough to work with him and to learn from him uh, so many things uh, and the way he has created an impact by bringing so many uh, stakeholders together uh, in this sector and uh, created a kind of awareness that is needed to eradicate this taboo topic So as um uh, so now you're currently general manager of World Toilet Organization uh, what is your I know you're super busy with uh I mean you just finished the World Toilet Summit in Nigeria uh, I know you're working on World uh, World Toilet Summit coming up is it I guess it's in is uh, is it Tokyo or I guess that's I don't know if that's still a secret <laughs> or if that's still in the process but uh Maybe tell us a little bit about your day-to-day work. Is that main? Are you mainly working with uh, reaching out to government government leaders and uh, uh, organizers, things of that nature? Uh, World Toilet Summit is one of our leading program. Apart from that, we are engaged with other activities as well, like uh, the Rainbow School Toilet Program, wherein we are building toilets in schools to create. Uh, uh pilot uh, successful pilot uh, models uh, for government to replicate and take it to scale apart from that we have a world toilet college program which is a skill building program and through this program we are trying to map uh, the gaps in the sanitation sector and develop courses to um, help uh, sanitation professionals to uh, address their challenges and find solutions we also do a lot of advocacy activities through our speaking engagement then uh, we as i mentioned that world toilet college is one of our leading program uh, because it helps us uh, in working closely with the, the government and corporates to bring a uh, change in the sanitation sector and create a sanitation economy we are working on uh, this project and talking to a lot of uh, potential stakeholders creating leads for uh, upcoming years tokyo is one of uh, our preferred location because the kind of the work japanese government has done in sanitation sector is amazing and we want to share those uh, case studies learning best practices from japan with uh, everyone in the world so that they can replicate it uh in their countries as well 
I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Let's see. Hopefully, we'll do it uh, this year in Japan. Yes, I hope so. I couldn't. I couldn't uh, get Kelsey to come to Nigeria, but maybe Tokyo. Maybe might happen. Yeah, looking forward to see you both there. <laughs> um. So. Uh, yeah. So obviously the advocacy, uh, you know, I, you see Jack everywhere. I see him on podcasts. I see him on, uh, on YouTube. He's always out there being the face of it. What, what's, um, what, what's the long-term vision of uh, world toilet organization as far as, uh, I mean, beyond, beyond just the summits and the, and the, how, how do you, uh, how do you, what, what are some goals that world toilet organization has for the near term? When we started the World Toilet Organization in 2001, our vision was to ensure that everyone in the world has at least a decent toilet. Over the period, we realized that just ensuring toilets is not going to solve the problem. We need to look at this uh, uh, problem in a holistic way. We need to ensure that uh, uh, all the toilet waste is uh, safely managed and not dumped into uh, the water bodies because then the problem stays. People are maybe defecating in uh, behind the closed walls, but uh, we are not managing the uh, problem sustainably and in a safe way. Going forward, our focus has shifted from promoting toilets to sustainable and safe sanitation. And this year, our focus is on building an institution. WTO was more uh, was equivalent uh, to Jack. We are now working on making this organization beyond Jack. Uh, what, what kind of a legacy Jack wants to leave behind? So Jack is very pertinent uh, to see what kind of an institution he can create with the help of board members and recruit new staff in the coming years. So right now, uh, we are working on that piece. Apart from uh, ensuring sustainable and safe sanitation at the global level. Yeah, I think Jack is going to live forever. So I don't know why you're doing that. I mean, he's got so much energy. He can go another 100 years. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but, but maybe, his, but maybe after 100 years, he might, he might want to, you know, he might want to relax. So, you know, I think that's a great goal to have. Yeah, he, he has a heart and soul of a young kid. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, you've got the world toilet, you know, you've got these different organizations. I think you, you guys have uh, uh, been involved. Uh, I mean, obviously helping create awareness around world toilet day in general, right? You guys do a lot of uh, outreach, uh, promotion about that. Um, um, I know the pandemic was a little bit of a challenge with, uh, I think it seems like before the pandemic, you would do the, what was it? The, the, you do different, um, five, was it a 5k run? Like, you know, there was different like or activities like that, that you would, you would promote. Is that still something you guys focus on? Yes, we are relaunching our Urgent Run this year and we are starting, uh, it's on 7th of May in Singapore. Oh, okay, okay. 7th of May. I need to put that on my calendar. I going to say, Darren's going to go book a flight, run the 5K, <laughs> run to run Singapore. This is it. I've got to get my, got to get some new running shoes broken in by then. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. Come join us. It will be a lot of fun. It sounds like it. I'm like wishing that we had that in our area because yeah, it just, yeah. you know, we have a huge runners community. And I think that that's something that really helps people to feel like they can be a part of something without having to make it their whole identity. Right. And for so many humanitarian, for so many humanitarian minded people, there's just not enough time to go around to dedicate their, you know, their love and their passion to all these causes. And as I'm thinking about, you know, wow, WTO without Jack, it just seems like, yeah, is, can that happen when he's so lively and vibrant? But then I think about, 
you know, the amazing colleges that WTO has established in India. And I'm, I'm curious what the future of sanitation colleges look like in other areas of the world. Because at least to my knowledge, and maybe this is where you need to educate me, I only know of the one in India. Is WTO working to establish other hygiene sanitation colleges for sanitation workers in other parts of the world? Yes, we are very much keen on setting up colleges across the globe. Uh, We started uh, the World Toilet College in 2005 in Singapore. and We partnered with Singapore Polytechnic to run the program for a couple of years in Singapore. We still organize a lot of trainings in Singapore, but uh, in 2015, we partnered with Reckett Ben Kaiser. And with their generate, generous support and leadership, uh, we are uh, running it across the country. We started with first in Parmarth Niketan in Rishikesh, and then we started on the request of uh, CM uh, Maharashtra in uh, in Aurangabad. And now we are running six colleges in India, and the plan is to uh, have at least one one center in every state in India, and it's quite a big uh, program wherein over 20,000 participants are trained every year through online classes. Uh, We are in discussions with the government in Nigeria as well to start one in Nigeria soon. And we believe uh, there is a huge need uh, to end open defecation and provide sustainable sanitation in the continent of Africa. We were quite uh, uh, successful in doing our first event in Nigeria with support of uh, uh, the president of the country. Uh, Going forward, the plan is to go to other countries in African continent and create awareness and uh, ensure that with the government participation, we can create some kind of a sanitation economy in the country. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the World Toilet Summit in Nigeria. Uh, what um, what was your biggest takeaway from the conference, uh, from the summit? My biggest takeaway was that uh, a political will is a must to bring a change. When the political will is there, we can uh, bring a big change with the, by bringing all the stakeholders together. Like uh, uh, we have seen that uh, government was ready to uh, uh, ready to change the sanitation scenario and they were ready to provide an enabling environment to different stakeholders like corporate and corporates have given their full support to the government to, uh, to end uh, the open defecation, create sustainable sanitation, ensuring small enterprises, providing a lot of resources through their CSR, uh, through their innovation uh, ways, and in many other ways. So any big collaboration needs uh, support of government and corporate stakeholders. And with their uh, aligned vision and mission, we can bring a very big change in any country. That's awesome. Yeah, I was super impressed with the, um, the yeah, the go- how how strong the government got behind it. But not only government, but also private industry. Uh, you've got a lot of participants. Uh, I think it happens on so many different levels, and I think the summit is just a great, which is a great platform to make that happen. Yeah, uh, we had seen participation of over four hundred. Uh, people at the event uh, from 40 different countries and uh, there was academia, there was uh, a non-profit organization, foundation, corporates, government representatives, all working to, uh, together towards a common vision of ending open defecation and creating sustainable sanitation in the country, which was amazing. And uh, we hope uh, that uh, the same success story, we can replicate it uh, in other uh, countries in Africa and the world. 
Yeah, obviously there's cultural differences between Africa and like say Japan, right? So what what sort of things, let's say it, you know, um if the if the summit happens in Japan, what what kind of summit do you anticipate being there? Is it more is it more technology driven? Is it more this is the high end of the spectrum versus the low end? I mean, what what do you see there? I think uh, first sanitation is needed at all the levels. Uh, it's it's a misconception that it's a developing country problem. But even when we go to countries like uh, London, uh, it, we might be surprised to hear that all the fecal matter is dumped in river thing, and no one is aware of uh, their uh, underground sewage system where it starts, where it ends, how it is clean, how it is managed, no one has an idea of it. So uh, uh, when we think of a summit in Japan, we think it in terms of technology, innovation, successful case studies, and a lot of learning that uh, all these countries, not only the developing, but developed countries can also learn from them, and replicate it in their uh, country. So I think uh, every country in the world uh, needs to work on one or the another aspect of sanitation value chain. Some uh, uh, Somewhere countries like Africa are struggling to have toilets, but uh, maybe uh, in countries like India, where because of Prime Minister Modi, we have ensured toilets in everyone's house. Managing the waste is a problem, and same uh, with the countries like London so, or cities like London. So this is something where we need uh, improved uh, innovations and high level of awareness uh, to solve the problem. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, even in urban areas like London, like you say, uh, yeah, I live here in Puerto Rico, and San Juan is like a urban modern city, 2 million people, but, and there's been a few times, whether it's a hurricane or an earthquake or, you know, just routine maintenance and the water, the water gets shut off. And, you know, I realize we're just one, like one step removed from having to go open, <laughs> do open defecation or, or, I mean, it's, it's not, we're not far removed. And like you said, it seems like most of our, most of our news comes out of London, some or, some sort of you know, the, the infrastructure is great, but it's like, what, 150 years old. And it's, you know, unless you unless you reinvest and, and make it a priority, it's just going to go to shit, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Even like uh, uh, COVID has uh, brought to light that uh, health and hygiene are very important aspects of any human being. And if we ignore any of this, it is going to have a very bad impact on our overall uh, lifestyle. So uh, uh, we need to work towards sustainable sanitation and uh, make sure that uh, all the sewage systems are well maintained and well kept. Otherwise, they'll contaminate the water sources and uh, the possibility of falling sick is very high. So we we need uh, uh, to create a kind of an awareness because uh, I feel uh, there is a very poor uh, level of awareness in this sector. Uh, Jack has done uh, good work and created a lot of awareness at all the possible levels. However, still in uh, uh, water and sanitation is considered disconnected topics. They are considered as two interdependent, yeah, independent topics which are not linked together, which is not true. We need to create awareness that these two are linked together, and working on the two uh, together can help us help in solving the problem. I'm just over here thinking, Sarika. You know, we we talk so often about raising awareness, um, especially with youth, right? With hygienic processes, hand washing proper disposal of waste, whether that's human waste or lifestyle waste, you know, kitchen waste and things like that, anything that can cause yeah. disease. But what you're talking about is that we all have these different levels of awareness because we all operate in these different spheres of 
where our sanitation is, right? It's the problem in infrastructure, is the problem in innovation, is the problem in lack of education or toilets. And if we all had the level of awareness or approached the problem with what is your level of awareness, now let's just educate you to expand your mind and think about that. You don't you don't th- you don't think about it because the moment you flush uh, your toilet, the problem is gone. The problem uh, it becomes a problem for the government because government has to invest time and resources in managing that waste. And uh, there uh, and at the end of the government, there are so many competing priorities. As long as uh, general public don't see it as a problem. It is not a problem for the government. When uh, they people get to know about this as a problem, only when they realize that sanitation and water are connected. When sanitation waste is not properly disposed, it contaminates their water, and they fall sick very often. Or their kids have a challenge in going to the schools. Therefore, government don't prioritize sanitation as a problem or find solutions to it. Therefore, uh, organizations like WTO, it becomes its responsibility to create awareness and create awareness for uh, the local people so that they can demand safe sanitation by the government. Unfortunately, we're out of time, Sarika, but it's been such a joy to speak with you and learn from you. Thank you for all the work that you do for the World Toilet Organization and just for, you know, humanity in general. (laughs) What you're doing for us is not only saving lives, but increasing awareness, increasing people's capacity, improving their lives exponentially. I mean, it's truly incredible. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work that you're doing, for the people you're caring for and we're just making our world a better place. Hey, Sarika, like I said, she's a superstar. I mean, she just does so much. And to come from, you know, an area so unrelated to sanitation and have the experience that she had with her child and and saying, no, this is a problem I really, you know, mm-hmm. the world needs to wake up to, I think is just level one for all of us, right? And sometimes in sanitation, we don't realize how important sanitation is until we have a scary run in or, you know, we get sick or I mean, oh man, I just remember a family member getting E. coli last year and she was out for days. Mm. It's just, oh, breaks my heart. So I don't want anybody to experience that. Yeah, And that's why we're here in the Zulu podcast. That's why Sarika is doing the work that she's doing. Yeah. And what an interesting way to find out, like uh, that episode with her son having to go to the hospital and, you know, having that I don't know, it was an E. coli or was some side of yeah. intestinal disease yeah. and it kind of opened up. And then guess what? That opened up a whole new career chapter for her. And yeah. And she was, um, yeah, at the world toilet so much behind Jack Sim, of course, but she was like right there, you know, super, uh, visible and, you know, giving speeches and, and all the rest of it. So Doing yeah, she does work. a lot of work. So yeah, we're excited to, continue to partner with the world toilet organization and, you know, continue continue to work with them and we'll find out where the next summit is. Uh, We keep saying Tokyo, it's Uh, not a, it's not a locked deal. So, but uh, we hope for the best that we can help make that happen. I know that would be amazing, but anywhere, anywhere that it's going to be is going to be amazing, you know? So we just love it. We're so grateful to WTO for the work that they do. So Rika, special thanks to you for all the work that you do. And uh, listeners, special thanks to you. Special (laughs) thanks to you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for sharing. We'll catch you next week. Thank you for listening to the Zulu Podcast. Follow us on social media at our links in the show notes below. To learn more, visit our website, Zulu.org. If you liked the podcast, be sure to subscribe, like, and comment. For even more Zulu fun, send us an email with your toilet stories to podcast at Zulu.com for a chance to be featured on the podcast. This episode of the Zulu Podcast is sponsored by Zulu Inc., a benefit corporation dedicated to the goal of universal access to toilets, hygiene, clean water and sanitation through the power of social enterprise. Learn more at Zulu.com.